Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even, one would dare even to die. Our God, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more than that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. May God add blessing and wisdom. Good morning. Last week, we ended our time in Romans 5, 1 to 5 by looking at the logical chain of interconnected steps which outline the process of God's salvation for believers. And whenever we're studying the Word of God, we don't just want to ask, what does this say? But we want to ask, why is it saying this? So I want to look at that a little bit more this morning. Paul's purpose in forging these logical sequences is to highlight the unbroken and secure nature of God's redemptive plan for those who belong to him. To put it more simply, this chain is meant to give genuine believers a real assurance of salvation. There are actually three sequences or series of chains in chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. The first was in verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope, in hope of the glory of God. So the point then is that believers can rejoice, or more accurately in the Greek, boast in hope of the glory of God now, even though that uh, perfection in glory is not something we are currently enjoying, but because it is assured to us by the chain of Paul's logic. Those who have been justified by faith can now already boast of God's salvation because it is as good as done, or rather, it is done, although we do not yet see it. The second logical series adds to the first by telling us how we can be assured that we are indeed saved, Romans 5, 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. As suffering produces endurance, and endurance, character, and character, hope, the logical chain, one after another, uh, shows how, as we are made more holy in our character, we have assurance that we have received God's love through the gift of His indwelling Spirit. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. We see that because of what we have now, we will also certainly receive these later things that are promised to us. And as we see our own sinful hearts being transformed, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we belong to God. And this ultimately gives us an unassailable assurance of salvation. Now, this is a a Protestant doctrine. One of the things uh, that was worked on by by John Calvin, particularly, that Christians can have this assurance. They can know that they are really Christians. Uh, Others uh, who 
call themselves Christians but are not evangelical traditionally, would say things like, well, we hope we will be saved. Hopefully we do enough things, and at, at the balance sheet at the end of life, we hope to see that we will have done enough and God will count us righteous. But the Christian doctrine, the biblical doctrine, is that we can know we will be counted righteous on the last day because we have been declared righteous now by faith. Now, many today speak of having this assurance of salvation that believers can really know and say, Christ has saved me, and yet the meaning has changed from the time of the Protestant Reformation. They might say that they know someone has been saved because they prayed a certain prayer or because they were baptized, but then that person, depending on their behavior, might not receive all of the blessing God has available for them or that they haven't yet earned the full eternal reward, or that they might not have all of God's favor, or even that they might lose the salvation that they currently enjoy. Now, this is really no salvation at all, but but merely a wish, and that a slim chance. To say, I am saved, and then to say, well, you know, I might be, uh, those are two different stories completely. One is a sure thing. I know I am saved. Christ has saved me. Another is to say, well, I, I think I'm like in the camp now, but I might be in and out. Hopefully at the end, I'll be in. Hopefully I'll be doing the right things at that time. Genuine salvation is salvation to the full, John eight thirty six. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And it includes all of God's favor, Ephesians 1, 3, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places earned not by us but by Christ Jesus and granted to us freely through faith. And this inheritance, 1 Peter 1, 4, is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You see, we have different religions even within what calls themselves Christianity, where we have different words, or we use the same word for totally different things. What is salvation, according to the Bible? Well, it's not just your ticket in right now, and then maybe later down the road you're not doing all the right things. And so, these chains that Paul forges here, these logical chains of what will necessarily be connected are so vital for our assurance So as the Protestant reformers began to rediscover the biblical gospel after it was perverted by an apostate church, they saw here that Paul insisted that genuine salvation begins and ends with the reliable work of God himself who will not fail to complete the work he has started or anything that he has set out to do. Again, we have different We have the same word for different ideas. We say God, and we mean one thing, and other religions say God, and they mean something completely different. When we say God, we mean the God who is in full control and all-powerful and all-knowing and all-wise. And so nothing goes any way apart from His own will. We saw that the logical chains... Sorry, they saw, the reformers saw, the logical chains in Scripture unanimously proclaim that the one who has been justified by faith can now already rejoice and even publicly boast in future glory. Can you imagine? You you have something that's been promised to you. And you start to, to boast of it to your friends, like, I have this thing. You know, when I was a kid, there used to always be these other kids that would boast about stuff that they didn't have. It's like, my parents already bought me a car. I'm eight, but it's, it's a really nice sports car. They're like, yeah, sure, dude. We, we're, we're like that kid boasting about the thing that we don't have yet, but that is already guaranteed to us by our good Heavenly Father. And we rightly boast in what we do not yet have. We boast in hope of the glory of God, not just in what we have now. The, the most famous of these logical chains is Romans 8, 28 to 30, which is often called the golden chain of redemption or chain of salvation, Romans 8, 28. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice that these are all in the past tense. Although we do not yet see them all. For new, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. An unbreakable chain of God's revealed will. His secure plan for salvation. To say anything otherwise is to call God a liar. See, when God says, this is what I will do, and he lays out this chain, those he foreknew he predestined to be sanctified, those he predestined to be sanctified, he then called, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. This is a secure salvation, all of it to the full, based on the first steps that we see, the first evidence that we see of faith at work in us. When we see that suffering is producing endurance in us, an endurance character, then we know that we have hope. The final hope is now ours, brought to us today. We walk in that same rejoicing, that boasting of something that we are not yet in possession of, but is already ours by faith because God has declared it so. This, to rejoice in our glory, is to believe the Word of God. Now, Romans 8 takes the links first revealed in chapter 5, 1, beginning with the justification by faith, and then it shows that the chain of God's definite and unassailable plan of redemption has several earlier links, extending all the way back before time in the creation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4. Now, I I mentioned Romans 8 this morning because another vital link exists in the order of salvation, or the ordo salutis, as the Reformers called it, which takes place between the predestination and the gospel call. And that link is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, you might ask, Josh, why are we always talking about complicated things here? We're preaching through Romans Why do we talk about all these complex things? And, you know, I have to say that without God intending that the average Christian understand these things, I can't fathom why the New Testament was written. That is to say that these things are laid out for us, the, the, how God is saving, why God is saving, how God is glorifying himself, these things that we would call the intricate doctrines of Romans— Why else is the New Testament written? Why else is the Bible written than that Christians would understand these things? And so we need to try to to grasp them. We don't just push them aside and say, okay, this is for theologians, this is for scholars. I actually had an incredible conversation with a 10-year-old this last week about the sermon. And so, you know, there's people that are trying to grasp this. And God willing, we will by His Spirit. So there's a vital link that comes now in the passage we're looking at this morning. We have uh, links that go back into prehistory, before the foundations of the earth. We have links all the way to glory, the full perfection of Christians as God fully sanctifies them, makes them righteous, and glorifies them with him. But there's a link now that comes in Romans 5, 6 to 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now it's important that we see not only that this is one of the links in the the order of salvation, but where it comes. This salvation, this atonement, this death and burial and resurrection of Christ Jesus took place in the logic of salvation before we were called. Before we came to Christ, before we had faith, before we are justified, before we are sanctified, sorry, before we are justified by faith, before we are sanctified, before we are glorified, Christ died for sinners. And God not only planned when Christ would die, that it would come at the right time, but also had in mind the people for whom his death would be effective. And the timing was perfect in relation to God's plan to rescue the ungodly, which is while they were morally weak, unmotivated, and unwilling to come to God of their own accord. I want to jump to verse 7 for a minute because it provides a contrast to the full reality of what God has done for us. In in typical Greco-Roman thought and language, the righteous or just person was someone who kept all the rules. 
someone who would be judged not guilty, someone who, who hadn't uh, transgressed, whereas the good person was a moral benefactor, someone who would give you the shirt off his back if you were in need, someone you could count on. And this is the type of person someone might consider dying for because of what he had already done for them, which assumes that there was this deep relationship already. There were famous stories that the uh, audience, the original audience here, Paul's audience, would have been familiar with. The, the Greco-Roman world loved them a good bromance. That was like one of their, their favorite like, uh, types of story, uh, stories of, of friends who were so close and committed that one was willing to die for the other, risk it all for the other. But this is not at all what God has done for us. Christ laid his life down for us according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God while we were still weak in nature, ungodly in character, choosing to sin against him, verse 8, his enemies rather than his friends, verse 10. This is the astounding love of God. It is not like human love. A human might die for someone who has been particularly good to them, but even this is so rare it is legendary, and they wrote plays about it. By contrast, God sent Christ to die for those who were wicked and alienated from him. Paul has already reminded us, Romans 3.11, that no one seeks for God. But in order that God would accomplish his saving purposes, Romans 4, 5, he justifies the ungodly. Christ died for us before we made any move towards him. I want you to be aware that when we talk about this logical chain, we're not just talking about a timeline. I mean, when we read this, we can say Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Yeah, like, of course, because Christ died a long time ago. I wasn't even born yet, right? That's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul's not saying Christ died for you before you got saved, because that is true for literally everybody. That, that would be nonsense. It would be saying something that means nothing. Paul's saying that in the, in the logic of God's salvation, Christ's sacrifice was given for you while you were still an enemy of God. He died for us before we made any move towards us. He did not wait for us to clean up our act. He did not wait until we showed some kind of change of heart or because he detected in us some inclination towards him. Some have had the view that God loves people out of principle because it's the right thing to do. Uh, which is foolish because we are the enemies of God, sinners, wicked, those he promises in the Old Testament to judge, or people believe that God loves them in particular because there was just something inside them that God found irresistible. You know, he didn't want heaven without us. We're too good. We got too much special things going on. God just needed us. Such thoughts couldn't be more out of step with the Word of God. When God looked at us, he saw sinners, morally weak people of ungodly character who were in active rebellion against him, and he saved us anyway. Verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For us, as both our representative and our substitute, Jesus was not only our exemplar laying his life down, which we are then called to do also. You know, we get this confused as well. We say, Christ died in my instead of me, well, no, 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 Christ died and then invited you to come die as well, lay your life down, but he was our exemplar, setting for us a perfect example of obedience and suffering, but he also fully accomplished atonement for chosen sinners. He was our substitute. He took the punishment we deserved, but he paid the sacrifice we could never give because we did not live perfectly in the first place. We could not give the unblemished sacrifice necessary to appease the wrath of God. So Jesus is both our representative and our substitute, our example to us as well. Earlier in Romans 3, 25 and 26, Paul has argued that this sacrifice of atonement demonstrated God's justice while also justifying sinners. You know, he feels like he has to say, hey, wait, 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 God didn't just overlook sin. 
God didn't just let sin go. He did the just thing, and so he is both just and the justifier of those who believe. So first he's shown that this demonstrates God's justice will justify sinners, but now here he stresses that this action was at the same time a great demonstration of God's love for sinners. Verse 9, therefore, or since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. You see this connection here, this, this link in the chain? How do we know that we shall be saved? Because Christ died for us while we were sinners. If we've been justified by his blood, much more do we know we will be saved from the wrath of God. We have nothing to fear on the final day of judgment if we know that we have been justified by his blood. This is part of the chain, the atonement of Jesus Christ, or the atonement Christ offered on our behalf. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more than, if we know that that has taken place, much more than do we know that we will be saved by his life. You see the the logical chain here? If God has already given what is most costly and dear to him, will the death of his son not also accomplish everything he intended it to do? Of course it will. One might as well accuse God himself of foolish incompetence if it were not so. Can you imagine? God's like, you know what? I'm going to try to do this thing. I'm go- Let Jesus, we're, you're going to go. You're going to lay your life down. You're going to suffer terribly. You're gonna, this incredible cost that we can't even fathom as humans. And it's like, oh, man, we only accomplished 45% of what we wanted to do. Oh, man, you know, we, we tried, but we only accomplished 4% of, of what we set out to do. God is not incompetent. God is, God, is, God is not man that he should set out to accomplish something and fail. So the logical chain that Paul is drawing us to, to see here is if Christ did this, if he laid his life down for us, he will also accomplish everything else that is promised. If we were already reconciled to God by the death of his son, don't we know that we will ultimately be saved by his life? Romans 8.32 spells this out plainly. He did, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We can rejoice now, we can boast now in all that God has promised when we see indeed that the Holy Spirit is at work in us, making us endure suffering and changing us in our character. Then we have hope in the glory of God. Now, in our modern way of speaking, we often use the term salvation as if it were an exact equivalent to justification. So, we often, when we come to faith, we don't just say, I was justified. Hey, my friend, he gave his life to Jesus. He was justified. Usually, we say he was saved, right? He he came to salvation. And it's not wrong to do this, But this is not the case of the New Testament. The concept of salvation is used in complex ways to communicate various aspects of God's salvation. It is used in the past, present, imperfect, and future tenses so that there is a sense in which we were saved, we are saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved because the, the full complex of salvation covers the whole of the Christian experience. We were justified by the blood of Christ before we were ever born. And along with the Old Testament saints who lived before Jesus died, we were saved in that Ephesians 1.4, God chooses us and gave us to belong to Jesus before the foundation of the world, foundations of the world were formed. So we, we can say we were saved before the earth was even created. When God determined his plan of salvation. We can also say that we are saved. It's not wrong to say we are saved in that our justification has been appropriated by faith alone. We gain access, Romans 5, 2, by faith into this grace in which we stand. And Romans 4, 22 to 25, we have righteousness accredited to our account as Abraham did. We are saved. 
but we are also being saved. And the Bible uses it in this tense as well. Uh, We see the evidence of our salvation being realized through the process of sanctification. This is the evidence that we're looking for, church. So that we can, uh, chapter 5, verse 2, rejoice in hope of the glory of God now and know, verse 5, that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so we need to know, we need to have the assurance that we are being saved. Are we patiently enduring the suffering promised to all genuine Christ followers so that it might produce in us the divine character? And if so, We know that we shall be saved. He will never let us go. The grip of God will hold. We are now justified. If we are now justified, we will certainly receive ultimate salvation and future glory. Hope is already secure in the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. This church is the whole point. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul writes, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right from the beginning of the church, before the apostles had even finished writing the New Testament, there was already a felt tension between these two messages. The, the necessity for Christians to walk in righteous obedience and the gospel message of salvation by grace alone through faith alone. You ever felt that tension? You ever thought about these things? How can salvation be totally free, and at the same time, we're told we have to lay our lives down, take up our cross, and follow Jesus, and we're supposed to obey Him, and we're supposed to just do everything He says? That doesn't sound very free. You ever, ever wrestled with that? Just me? No, a couple, a couple of people wrestle with that. How can we say salvation is by grace alone and then say you have to obey Jesus? These logical chains are so necessary for understanding these things. Paul's critics might ask, how could Paul claim that someone was saved and made righteous by faith alone When the scriptures teach that God will by no means clear the guilty. And did not Jesus teach, Mark 13, 13, that only the one who endures to the end will be saved? Does Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul has already expressed as much here in Romans. Romans 2, 6 to 8, we'll turn back there. He, God will render to each one according to his works. This is the New Testament church. This is the Bible. He, God, will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So the solution to the apparent contradiction between the righteous requirement for good works and the grace alone gospel that Paul preaches are the logical chains of Romans 5 and Romans 8. How can Paul teach both that God will render to each one according to his works and that we have been justified by faith? He forges the series of links from one to another, showing that the one God declared righteous by faith, will endure suffering to produce endurance, and endurance will produce character. Those whom God foreknew and predestined, Romans 8, 28 to 30, He also predetermined that they would be sanctified into the likeness of His Son, and those are the ones He called, and the ones He called He has justified by the blood of Christ, and the ones He justified He also glorified. The golden chain will hold because God has publicly announced His will in this. And he is more than able to cause us to stand, Romans 14, 4, and to keep us from stumbling, Jude 24. This is why we can boast now. Verse 11, more than that, more than a guarantee of future salvation, 
We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. More than just giving us a guarantee, that's not the purpose, right? The purpose is for us to respond. There's a, mean, a, a, a purpose in why we are coming to understand the meaning of these things. The golden chain gives us great reason to boast. Since what Jesus has accomplished for us is greater than anything else that has been done since the creation of the world. Through him, we have been reconciled to the God of the universe. Now, that is something to boast about. Indeed, what God is calling us to do here through Paul, and this is why the translation boast rather than rejoice is important, is to glorify Him as God, Romans 1.21. So, Paul began this portion of his letter focused on boasting, verse 2, we boast in hope of the glory of God. And verse 3, we boast in our sufferings because of what it does for us. And now a third boast is introduced in verse 11. We boast in God's work in our justification. We can already boast, church, in our hope of glory because Christ has died. These links are indivisible. They they cannot be broken apart. The reality of one is evidence of the other. And so in in this section, three types of boasting should characterize the Christian life. Number one, boasting in hope of the glory of God. Number two, boasting in our suffering because of what it does for us. And number three, boasting in what Jesus has done to reconcile us to God and justify us. Each of these is supposed to be central to the Christian experience until the day of our death. We are supposed to be living a life of rejoicing. And so the criticism this morning, the conviction that we need to be feeling this morning uh, before the Word of God is that we have not appropriately rejoiced enough. You are just not celebrating. I am just not celebrating quite enough the fullness of what we have received in Christ Jesus. Maybe I'm like one of those people that thinks, you know, I did this this thing, I made this decision, I said this prayer, I got baptized, but who knows what happens between now and death. Or maybe we haven't thought about what it is that we truly have received in Christ Jesus. Maybe we have never realized that the Bible promises that those who have been justified by faith will also receive every heavenly blessing in Christ Jesus. Maybe we think that we've got our foot in the door. Maybe we think, you know, I've got in through the crack here, and now, you know, I'll get as, as much as I can, but, oh man, I'm weak. I'm not really probably earning that much of God's favor You know, I probably don't really have a great eternal reward waiting for me because I really haven't done enough good. And so we are failing to appropriately rejoice that we have received the inheritance of Christ. We have failed to appropriately rejoice in the fullness of our salvation. We, some of us have never even really experienced the joy of our salvation. And as David prays, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. My prayer for us this morning, church, is that God would show us and restore to us the joy of our salvation. That we would be a church that comes rejoicing into the house of God. That we would be a church that is constantly so thankful to God for what He has done. Always living in reciprocation, responding to the great love of God. Not as false religion teaches, as those who are trying to earn the favor of God or earn the blessings of God or what might we eke out of this, what might we get out of this religious experience, but celebrating what we have already received as a free gift through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so our passage this morning has been a culmination of what Paul has been saying from the beginning of Romans. That the righteousness of God, verse 17, is revealed from faith for faith, and that the righteous shall live by faith. And that those who have been justified by faith will, chapter 2, verse 7, by patience and well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality and receive eternal life. So how do we know 
if we've been justified by faith. These things are taking place. We see the, the links of the chain taking place in our life. Yes, yes, I came to faith. I entrusted myself to Jesus. I believed the promises of God. I tr- learned to trust that God is faithful. And yeah, then some bad things happened to me. Then some tough circumstances came out. Then I got sick. Then I lost someone I love. And, and it was hard, but through that endurance and through continuing to give thanks to God through every trial and suffering, I see that that endurance is now producing character in me. I'm not the person I was. In fact, I'm not a person I could have ever become. I haven't just matured in my age. I literally have become a, a different person in that I could never be the kind of person that loves others this way or cares about others this way or is so fervent in, in obedience to God. This is utterly different than who I am. And then I know that I have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I can rejoice now in all the later chains that are connected to this one. I rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I rejoice that I've received every heavenly blessing in Christ Jesus. I rejoice that his inheritance is mine. And we also rejoice in knowing that we will be further sanctified. That he who who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. One of, one of the greatest things that I'm trying to choose to rejoice in now is that I'm going to be a lot better of a person than I am now someday. I'm going to be a lot more obedient and a lot more sanctified someday than, than I could ever be, heart, try as I might. So we know that those who have been justified by faith will, by patience in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality and receive eternal life. Such is the strength of power, wisdom, and glory of our God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that you spent and the the time you sent your apostle to spend teaching us your word. God, I'm so thankful for this, your perfect word that expresses to us your perfect truth. God, I'm not someone that can be relied on to bring a good word, but your word is good. And so, Lord, we're so thankful to you for that. Lord, we thank you for the the golden chain of redemption, the plan of salvation that you determined before the foundations of the earth. We thank you that you predestined us for sanctification, that as we come to be justified by the shed blood of Christ and experience that justification through faith, that we know we will be transformed. And Lord, as we are being transformed, we thank you for the hope of glory. May we walk in great rejoicing, boasting even in the hope that we have the suffering we get to endure, and the great work of our Savior who died for us in our place. Lord, may our lives be a continual celebration, a continual thanksgiving, a boasting, a rejoicing in what you have done. And Lord, we thank you for such a beautiful word, a beautiful rebuke that tells us that you just have not been happy enough, (laughs) that you have not just rejoiced enough in the goodness of your God. What a miraculous word that one of the most common commands throughout all of Scripture is to remember and to rejoice. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do this in us by your Holy Spirit, that we would remember your goodness, remember your promise and that we would be a people always rejoicing. We ask this for the glory of Jesus as we boast in him. Amen.